All right, you're good. Live? Yep, mm -hmm. you're live. Somebody I have one person on there. Right, so it's live. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's see. Hopefully, it's we're gonna go live. Uh, we got two. We're live. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Um, I'm going to start off with a quick intro. Raise your hand if you don't know who I am. Oh, everybody knows. Okay, no intro then. I'm just going to start with the material. Okay, so let's start off with this book. I bought this book <clears throat> probably 2001. It came out in 1999. And it's called The Curse of Louis Pasteur. Has anybody ever seen this book before? Okay, it's probably the pinkest book. <laughs> but I read through it, and I still have the notes when I read through it, whatever, how many years ago. And I got little tabs right there. And as I was reading through these notes this morning, um, you know, I was trying to form a, a, a lecture. Right here at the top is this history lecture. What this is talking about is um, guys that discovered organisms that did not meet the the standard description of what organisms were, meaning bacteria, fungus, etc. And they gave different names, and I created a slide about it. And I'm going to get into this more, but here's the deal. So the topic of this is about nanobacteria. So these are teeny tiny bacteria, They're like 25 to 200 nanometers big. And, um... Yeah, got it. Okay. And so these uh, nanobacteria have been studying for over a year because they are a cause of heart disease and calcification of the arteries and calcification of like kidney stones, gallstones, and a decrease of, of uh, fluidity in the body. So if you see somebody who's older and they walk like this and they take steps very slowly and they're careful with their arms and they're just slower and they can't turn their, can't turn their neck, their, their body is turning into stone. And nanobacteria cause that. And so um, about a year and a half ago or more, somebody contacted me about a supplement that fixes that. And I had been studying ketosis for a number of years before that. And ketosis makes the body fat fluid. And fat makes you mobile. And the opposite of fat is sugar. And sugar is sticky. And sugar deplete, sugar makes your it dries your body out. So you want to reverse that by getting into ketosis and making your joints fluid and making your arteries fluid. And it also, uh, ketosis also pulls the fat out of your arteries and your organs. And the first bit of fat that gets metabolized is in your torso. So your um, uh, fatty liver disease goes away, your pancreas becomes less fatty, that reverses t uh, diabetes. Okay, but let's talk about nanobacteria as described um, in modern times. There's uh, research on this in PubMed, and there's a website, which, and I have the resources here in these slides. So another name for the nanobacteria is um, calcifying nanoparticle, CNP. I need a pointer, red laser pointer. There might be one at the front desk, or there might be one in my desk on the right. You know, when you're sitting at my desk, in the drawer on the right. Or it's in this red bag. Where'd the red bag go? It's back there. There's the red bag. Okay, so calcifying nanoparticle. So they call it, some people call it a nanoparticle and as opposed to nanobacteria because it's questionable whether or not it's alive. It could be like not alive. So the second bullet point there says contagious. It is contagious and it is not alive. Its metabolism is 10,000 times slower than E. coli, meaning that it replicates every three to six days, which is an eternity, especially at that size. So viruses or bacteria can replicate in seconds or minutes. So you know, you catch a cold, like you, there it is in the throat, and then within a few hours, it's like all over. It's because it replicates so fast. It's the smallest known self-replicating infectious pathogen. It's too small to be seen by regular microscopes. That's why it was missed so for, for so long, especially in conventional labs. 
or university labs or a microscope at a, at a doctor's office. Um, discovered in modern times in 1998 by two Finnish people, uh, Kahander is, seems to be the guy in charge of all that. I need a, a laser pointer. It might be in that red bag. Um, it, is proposed, it has been proposed that calcifying nanoparticles may be formed under physiological conditions of blood or serum as mineral low protein complexes during certain alterations in homeostasis within normal limits and consequently they cannot be live objects. So they're, it's like a, like a mineral and a protein complex and it forms when you're weak, that's what that means, um, under certain alterations in homeostasis within normal limits. You're just weak, you're just tired, you just ate too much sugar. That's when these things form. They form like that proverbial mud, um, mud puddle where the lightning strikes and then you got bacteria, you know, like the, <laughs> the, how life supposedly was formed. That's what this is. So earlier discoveries, this is kind of small, sorry, but there's a guy named Gunther Enderlein. He died in 1968. He found these and he called them endobiots. And another guy named Gaston Nasens, he called them somatids, Royal Rife. He was a master optician and he had this huge microscope as big as a room that you didn't even have to plug into the wall. It took natural light and it amplified it. And he, he said that they were turquoise. He called them turquoise bodies or turquoise granules. He also called them pinpoint cells. And he said they can pass through filters capable of blocking any microbe larger than a virus. All right, and then Antoine Bechamp, he was um, Louis Pasteur's nemesis in France. Antoine Bechamp called them microzymas or little bodies, and he said they ferment. So back then in the 1800s, they're discussing whether or not fermentation was caused by like an external bacteria sort of animal type thing, or did it come from within? And, he, and Bechamp said that it comes from within. He also coined this term pleomorphic, Pleomorphism. So what that means is you have an organism that changes. So pleo means many, morph means shape. And it's kind of like a tadpole turning into a toad or a, a moth or a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's the same animal, but a completely different shape and a completely different environment. So the caterpillar is on the ground or on a stick and there's a butterfly that's in the air or a tadpole's in the water and then the frog is on land. So pleomorphism. Uh, Wilhelm Reich found these two. He called them bions. He said they were transitional vesicles lying midway between life and lifeless, or the animate and inert. He said they were a strange blue color. Thanks. This should work okay. Let's see how good this works. Hang on. Okay, good. Um, uh, Walter Cannon found them. He called them cells that could go dormant. Um, he said they're harmless but could change, pleomorphism, and cause disease in a weakened state out of homeostasis. So all these people said the same thing in a different decade, over 130 years. No, other terms would be cryptocytes, primordialis, primordialis, and progenitor cryptocytes. Um, can you grab a test kit, one of my test kits? Not the organs one, but the other one. You know, just grab two, the two yellow test kits. All right, Claude Bernard, um, he also, he's a physiologist from the 1800s. He said fermentation is from a soluble, lifeless ferment. So he was onto it too. He said whatever is fermenting alcohol or fermenting fruit, it's lifeless. Thanks. I made these test kits when I do the muscle testing procedure. And um, these are all my terms in the vials I made. Are you guys familiar with muscle testing? Okay, good. So this one right here is Cryptocytes primordialis. Like I made this based off of what these people were saying from this book. So when somebody's really sick, I'll find this one. 
But if somebody just has a cold, I'll find virus. Or if somebody has fungus, I'll find fungus. But when somebody has some like chronic illness that's severe, it could be progenitor cryptocytes. So I made this, to, you know, to find these almost lifeless proteo or protein slash mineral organisms that ferment. Okay, I also have macrobes and microzyma. These are terms that come from this book. Okay. Um, so in modern times, uh, calcifying nanoparticles were discovered by accident by this Finnish researcher, Nobel Prize nominee, Kahander, MD, PhD, as a contaminant of mammalian cell cultures. His cell cultures kept routinely dying after a period of time. He investigated further and discovered it was these CMPs infecting his cell cultures and killing them through the process of cellular apoptosis, which means cell death. Kahander called them nanobacteria because they were nanometer sized. So calcifying nanoparticles uh, utilize, this is interesting, utilize serum calcium and LDL cholesterol to manufacture pathological calcification deposits under normal serum blood calcium conditions. So this is why people think that LDL particles are the cause of heart disease. And there's no research that shows that LDL is the cause of heart disease. But these nanoparticles form calcium around them. What they do is they, they create um, a film, a biofilm, an exudate that they put out and, and it becomes calcified. And they use LDL as their food and they oxidize the LDL. Oxidized LDL causes harm to your arteries. It causes like a, a trauma inside your arteries. All right, but never is, LDL is not the cause of heart disease, but it's implicated in two ways. Number one, it feeds these nanobacteria. And number two, it, it, the LDL can be damaged by sugar from the high sugar standard American diet. And then that now it's called a glyc like an oxidized LDL that causes harm to the artery. But LDL is not the cause. Got that? That's super important. Okay. Prior to the discovery of these uh, calcifying nanoparticles, science has not been able to explain how such calcification is possible. Previously, scientists just accepted the unexplainable disease-related calcification development in our bodies as a mysterious unknown phenomenon of aging. Now, I like to read old, old books in healthcare, meaning like going back 100 years. And in the 1950s, they, called, they just said it was a potassium deficiency. So like if you don't have enough potassium in your body, the calcium in relation to potassium goes too high. So then your tissues get stiff. And that makes sense. Like if your um, minerals are out of balance, you can get stiff just from that. But this goes deeper. And um, I think that they're both valid. Okay, so they're tough to kill um, in culture and in humans. They're extremely resistant to destruction, including penicillins, cephalosporins, um, macrolides, these are medications, acids. They li live up to 194 degrees Fahrenheit heat for an hour. Uh, freezing doesn't kill them. Uh, Nanochloral silver, radiation doesn't, don't, doesn't kill them. They easily circumvent and defeat our immune defense systems and they cause cell apoptosis, cell death, and they alter RNA and DNA replication. So they mess with your the blueprint of your body. Um, so one thing I want to say is that the guy Kandahar that found this in modern times, he did, he did have to have like a special filter that would capture these nanoparticles. So initially he had these uh, cell cultures dying in his lab. So he was filtering through trying to find what organism is killing those, his cell cultures. And um, he filtered through like the bacteria, the fungus, you know, that kind of stuff was, uh, became um, sort of excluded by process of elimination, but yet the cell cultures kept dying. So he had to get smaller and smaller filters to capture what might, you know, what might it be. And it turns out to be these nanobacteria, just like what was said over here about, um, what, Roy, what Rice said, that they pass through filters capable of blocking any microbe. And so Roy Rife did most of his work in the 1930s. So that's a true statement in 1998 when Kandahar, or Kahander found 
uh, nanobacteria. Okay, where are we at now? So, so putting these thoughts together, um, there are six causes of heart disease. <laughs> six. And um, this, I'm, I collect causes of heart disease. I collect causes of disease period. Some people collect roses or trinkets or... I also collect cars, by the way. <laughs> but, um, so seed oils, that's the vegetable oils. Okay, but we change the, the nomenclature to seed oils. So that would be like canola and mazola, the corn oils, um, peanuts, you know, um, whatever else seed oils that exist. They deplete vitamin K2 out of your body, and K2 is needed for unplacking your arteries. And then another cause is sugar. Sugar glycates. Glycates is a, is a verb. It damages your arterial walls. Sugar also glycates or damages or oxidizes LDL, which damages your arterial walls. And you can get simply chest pain and muscular weakness from insufficient heme iron. Heme iron comes from meat. That's the only source of heme iron is meat. And so I've seen this where I put people on more meat and their chest pain goes away, their angina goes away. And I experienced this myself. I had this deep chest pain back here and I thought it was from the black mold from the old office. And um, when I started eating more carnivore diet, instead of eating red meat twice a week, I'm, I'm eating it twice a day. But within three days, that chest pain was gone. So it wasn't the black mold causing that deep chest pain. It was a deficiency of red meat, of heme iron. And it could also be other things with the red meat, like carnitine, um, CoQ10, um, other nutrients. You can have structurally weak arteries just from protein insufficiency. So I have a patient years ago, five years ago or more, probably more, having TIAs, mini strokes. And she was a vegan. And I convinced her, you got to eat meat. And she did, and she hasn't had any problems ever since. So the, the arteries can just be weak from not having enough protein. Um, so one or, you can have one or more of four blood clotting factors high. And I can list these off for you. I've, done, I've said this many times in my videos. But there's four blood clotting factors that you can measure with the lab test. And here's what they are. Number one is lipoprotein A. Maybe I can write this up. I'll write it on this, on the paper. Lipo protein little a cysteine uh, fibrinogen and then C reactive protein CRP C reactive protein and there's one it's like nineteen dollars wholesale and for twenty one dollars you can do high sensitivity C reactive protein for the heart so. I have, so another test that's really important to do is called the coronary artery calcium score. I'll just put CAC. And that measures uh, calcium deposits. Yeah, thanks for turning the camera. That measures calcium deposits in the soft tissue in your chest. And if your, your score can be zero, I've seen this twice now, where somebody's score is zero, which means no chance of a heart attack basically for 15 years but they had three or four of these high and they had a heart attack. And it's a blood clot. It's not a cholesterol plaque. It's not a calcium deposit. These are blood clots. And the blood clot, it could show up in your lungs. And they diagnose you with a lung condition caused by blood clots. Or it could be in your, in your arteries. It could be in your brain. Now you have a stroke. It could be in your heart. Now you have a heart attack. But the problem is a blood clot. So I've seen this twice where this is zero, but people had heart attacks here. And one of these guys um, ended up in the hospital for a month. Never once did they tell him what his cholesterol levels were because his cholesterol was normal. They did three scopes. Into his, they did the catheterization into his heart, looking three times, looking for the cholesterol plaque. And why did they do it three times? Because there wasn't any. Because it was a blood clot. 
But they still put a stent in him, and they probably should not have done that. And they should have run these four. But why don't they run these four? They don't run these four because there's no medication for these four. You can only fix these with uh, diet and supplements. You want the solutions right now? I'll tell you right now what the solutions are. Mm -hmm. Ketosis, ketosis, <laughs> ketosis. And this one is a methylated B vitamin. So like, there's a lot on the market. You can buy these at a health food store. Methyl B, methylated B, something like that. Keto, 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 methyl. <clears throat> okay. So the last one, the calcifying nanoparticles for uh, causes for heart disease. And there, there's probably more, but I've collected six so far. Um, okay, here's some conditions that the calcifying nanoparticles have been detected and isolated in virtually all human organs and systems, and do, they do cross the blood-brain barrier. They've been seen as calcification or uncalcified forms in urine and kidney stones. It's like 97% of kidney stones have the nanobacteria in them. And I'm going to show you videos. You'll see the process. <clears throat> okay, um, so kidney stones, bile and gallbladder stones, are atherosclerotic plaque in the arteries, cataracts. Cataracts is like your eyes turning to stone. Alzheimer's disease in the brain, vascular dementia, the arteries in the brain are turning to stone, heart valves turning to stone, kidney cysts, liver cysts. It's like the cysts are a version of a, a stone. Fibromyalgia. Um, cysts and, and um, fibroids go away with ketosis. So it's important that if, you're, if you have nanobacteria, you have atherosclerotic plaques or stones, uh, ketosis is important. It's important to do. Um, fibromyalgia, fetal bovine serum, it's in cows. Viral vaccines, it's in vaccines. It's contagious. Cancers, prostate stones, testicular stones. BPH is benign prostatic hypertrophy, prostatitisma, skin conditions, psoriasis, scleroderma, atopic dermatitis. Brain sand, it's like a version of uh, the brain turning into cal um, calcified, like pineal gland or something. So pineal and pituitary calcification and many others. Many prominent researchers agree that pathological calcification is caused by calcifying nanoparticles, infections, wherever they are found in the human system. So this is a big deal. And it's really ignored quite extensively throughout medicine. And number one, because it's new. And number two, because it's new, I guess. All right, they're also direct, they directly cause or participate in many pathological events, like pathways, such as inflammation, endovascular and neovascularization. So that means, well, I'll get into it, I'll get into it. Thrombosis, where a, a, a plaque gets uh, thrown loose. Chronic autoimmune activation, so autoimmunity, it's a big deal. Cell proliferation, that's kind of like cancer. Altered cell functions pathological calcification. Um, pathological calcification is like the disease process that's happening, making your joints stiff, as opposed to traumatic. So if you fall and you break your elbow, 20 years later it's calcified, that, does, that doesn't apply. Apoptosis, cell death, and subsequent tissue and organ system atrophy. They play an active role in the development of atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, heart valve calcification, kidney stones, and then polycystic kidney disease. So cysts, you see the pattern. Okay, these are my favorite solutions. So Nanobac TX, <clears throat> this is a supplement that uh, sort of put me down this path like two years ago. Um, it's one pill per two pounds of body weight before bed on an empty stomach. So if you're 200 pounds, it's 10, 10 pills before bed. And, uh, the, and then when you do that, what happens is you get the main ingredient, which is um, called editate disodium dicalcium. I think I have that in the next. Yeah, right here. So editate disodium dicalcium. That's the last ingredient on this list right here. 
So what that is, it's a version of EDTA. EDTA um, is a medicine that's usually administered by IV, and it grabs onto chemicals and toxins and pulls them out of the body. So, but the IV EDTA does not do a very good job compared to this. So the IV EDTA will stay in your body for 15 minutes. This stays in your body for 12 hours. So you take this at night, and now you're detoxing for 12 hours, and then um, do it again every single night. And so this, if you're doing eight per night, this will last a month. And um, I'll tell you the price right now, it's 199. I'm forced to sell it at that price. I can't go lower, I can't go higher. But if you do an IV EDTA, that's $200 or $300 and you do one, one a week, all right? So this is way cheaper and way more effective than IV EDTA. Um, so there's many forms of EDTA. Editate disodium dicalcium is one, and I found on Wikipedia there's probably 12 or 15 different versions of EDTA. It does put calcium in your bones while taking calcium out of the soft tissue. So I had somebody quit this product because they were afraid of losing bone, you know, getting calcium out of their bones. But it wasn't until today when I found out that it put, puts calcium in your bones. Okay, and then I have a couple of, um, of uh, links right here. This right here is a really good compilation of the whole subject from PubMed right there, from NIH, National Institutes of Health. And then this is the nanobiotech pharma.com website, they got 67 published research articles linked. So you can look up those research articles. <clears throat> so there's a lot of good information on this. <clears throat> so vitamin K2 is also very important in this whole protocol. And uh, it's not in here. So you have to take an extra K2. And um, <clears throat> you take D3 with it. D3 is not in here. We have a product called K2 D3 with high doses of both. And then the other part of the protocol is red meat in large quantities. <laughs> Think pounds, not ounces. So for today, for lunch, I had 1.74 pounds of meat. That was my lunch. And I will, probably won't have dinner. So I go to Plum Market, and they, got the hop, they just updated their hot bar. So they'll have, they have this one section. Raise your hand if you've been to Plum Market over here. Yeah. So they have a section where they have like, not, like a nacho cheese bar or with the nacho chips and the cheese and they got meat. I just get all the meat. I just like empty out the whole bowl and I put it in my bowl and I, I try to eyeball it and I've been working on this for the last few weeks so, um, so I know how much I can eat. And sometimes they have chicken in there but they put canola oil in the chicken so don't eat the chicken. And then other days they'll have this uh, kafta meatballs, which is lamb and beef combined. And that's really good. So today I had like six or seven of those. Um, so the, uh, that's part of the therapy for, um, this, uh, for uh, ketosis. Okay, so moving on. Low carbs, less than 20 grams a day gets you into ketosis. And then my favorite supplements would be Ceruta, Cataplex B, or G, or maybe both B and G. So why is this? I'm going to show you this. Do you have the cameras turned this way? I can pull this towards me. Okay, hopefully it doesn't fall. Okay, so we have causes of chronic disease, mechanisms and symptoms caused by organ dysfunction. In order to get rid of the symptoms, you feed the organs. But you can't forget the causes and you can't forget the mechanism. So in the causes section, we have pathogens. That's these nanobacteria, among other pathogens. But um, in 1934, Standard Process came out with two supplements to specifically address lactic acidosis, the mechanism of chronic disease, cataplex B or G. So that's why I put them up here. Now the mechanism, this is real quick, the mechanism of chronic disease is too much waste in the blood and not enough oxygen. 
so the cataplex B and G clean the waste out of the blood. And there's other, you know, this cleans waste out of blood. There's a lot, we have a lot of supplements that clean, clean the waste out of the blood. Okay, but I love B and G um, to feed the liver. It's pretty holistic. And they have a lot of nutrients in there, including liver. liver. But they, they remove the waste. And then the ceruta increases the oxygen in the blood. So here we have W for waste, O for oxygen. Too much waste relative to too, too, too little oxygen. Add in the B or the G that brings us down. Add in the ceruta that brings us up. Okay, so that's why I have those there. And then enzymes on an empty stomach. Nanobac TX has a lot of enzymes in there. And then people ask me all the time about serapeptase. It's super popular on the internet because somebody's marketing it very well. There's a lot of other enzymes that actually work better than serapeptase. And one in particular that I like to use is called Vaskizyme. It's a collection of enzymes. And we sell that. The company's um, orthomolecular. That's the name of the company. So enzymes on an empty stomach, like before bed or first thing when you wake up. If you take it with food, it'll digest your food, which is fine. But we want to digest the unwanted proteins and garbage and inflammatory stuff related to calcification. Okay, so this is my current favorite solution for heart issues, calcification, you know, what we're talking about. <clears throat> this is a protocol I put together two years ago, three years ago, somewhere in there. And um, all of these are from standard process, except for the last one. And I have a guy who, he was doing his uh, coronary artery calcium test. His score was 325. He started this protocol and it dropped down to 300, which is really good. And then we switched it over back to this, to this uh, basically this protocol right here. And three years later, his score is 275, somewhere in there. So he got more relief from this one than he did from this one. That's my only, that is an N equals one experiment. That is my only um, experience I have comparing the older protocol with the new protocol. But they both work. So I have a number of people where their CAC is coming down, their coronary artery calcium score is coming down by doing this plus ketosis. And they're both important, both ketosis and, and this product. Okay. Now, this is available online anywhere, and you don't have to be a patient to buy it. Um, and it's sold right on their website, too. So when I, you know, when I talk about supplements, people always online, they complain about how expensive it is, or I'm only trying to make money from supplements, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, but buy it wherever you want, and the price is set, not by me, but by somebody else. Okay, cool. Um, let's look at um, some videos. Here's this one. So I'm going to blow this up. There's no audio. I just didn't hook the audio. <clears throat> so it says calcified structures appear as large translucent particles. So you can see them right there. And you can see this dark outs like exterior wall. It's like an igloo. They make this wall for protection and they live in here. Now what they do is they, they make this and they go, they go dormant. And the dormant period is like six days. And what happens is there becomes, they, and imagine that they're embedded. I think this is in a petri dish, but imagine they're embedded in your artery, okay? And it's a calcified wall, and they're there for six days not doing anything. Well, by this time, your immune system is trying to revascularize, revascularize that area. So an artery comes in and starts feeding blood to the nanobacteria, and what's in the blood that the nanobacteria love to eat, that's LDL. LDL cholesterol. So they need calcium and LDL. So then they get their food and now they start to reproduce. They go into an active state where they live for three days before they replicate again. And then now that they're replicating again, they gather more calcium around them. They have more of the exudate around them. And they go through the cycle, three days, six days, three days, six days, three days, six days. And over time, there's just more and more buildup of the calcium and that's why you can have, like, I'm going to take this down. Um, 
There it is. So that's why you can have in an artery, like here's the plaque. Like it's, it's embedded in the musculature too. It's down in here. But why isn't it over here? How come there's not a plaque here, here, here? You know, it's not like everywhere. It's because the infection's right there. That's where it happened to be. That's where it happened to land. Just like you can have an infection in the ear or versus the sinus here or versus the, the hangnail that got infected. It's just where the bugs ended up landing. So, um, it was, you get that cycle, the three-day, six-day cycle, right? So, and either way, that's an eternity, especially six days. Like, that's a long time for these 25 nanometer particles to live before replicating. Okay, so um, this says, first live video of calcifying nanoparticles. So they're moving around. They're underneath a microscope. It says, decalcifying agent moves through the frame, dissolving the larger structures and releasing nanoparticles. So the largest, like, look at this one right here. I can, I'm going to back it up a little bit. See, just watch this and, like, watch this one. And see, it's a solid, uh, stable, you could call it stable structure. But in, in comes this uh, decalcifying agent, and then it, <clears throat> it dissolves. And this is dissolved now, and here's that nanobacteria right there. It's being released. Like that, so it gets all cleaned out like that. This is blood? Um, I don't know like, if this is in a petri dish, or I don't think it's blood because it would be a different color. But you get the idea. So nanoparticles are ejected from their calcified enclosures. So this showing you again how that works. It's like home movies, isn't it? So the released particles are being washed through the fluid. What? Yeah, definitely drink water. Yep. Impacts of decalcifying agent on inorganic calcium phosphate crystals seen under a light microscope. So just picture like um, kidney stones. <clears throat> so look how pointed that is, like a kidney stone or gallstone. And it's being broken up from the decal from the from the EDTA or the Editate disodium dicalcium. So you can have, consider the term pathological calcium. You can have too much calcium and in the wrong place. It's just as dangerous as mercury or cadmium or lead or tin or something like that. When, you, when you're talking about time and, um, and uh, disease condition. So here's another video. Nanobacteria are self-replicating bacterial-like particles 100-fold smaller than common bacteria. They can be cultured in cell culture media. They've been found in human and animal blood. They're difficult to see with light microscopy. You have to get a special... You can get like an electron microscope or there's two other um, microscopes that are more powerful. All right, let's see what this shows us. Nanobacteria colonies and biofilms produce calcium phosphate mineral appetite which makes them visible. Appetite is found in similar form in atherosclerotic plaques and in kidney stones. So what was that decalcifying agent again? Um, well, there's about 15 different versions of it. It's EDTA, or the one in this product is um, Editate Disodium Dicalcium. So this is the guy that discovered it, Kehander from uh, Finland. So there's, the, there's colonies. Look, it looks like a stone. It looks like sand, right? Colonies of nanobacteria wrap themselves up in calcium. So here's high magnification. Excuse me. Yeah. What keeps the bacteria from lodging into another spot? Is there something that kills the bacteria? How are you going to kill that bacteria besides releasing it from calcium? Um, you kill the bacteria with this EDTA Meditate disodium dicalcium or tetracycline works. So you take an of some kind? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend tech, I wouldn't recommend that though. No. Because then it wipes out all kinds of other things. You do the EDTA, disodium, you know, that do that stuff. Well the EDTA right. breaks the shell, the 
does that kill them? Yeah, that's a good question. My answer, not knowing too well, would be no. So that's why in this one you have um, vitamin C pep, uh, and grapeseed extract to help the immune system kill it. Right, so you break the calcium open, now it's released, then you got to kill it. With um, with grapeseed extract. Gary, Dr. Gary Mizo created this. He spent 20 million of his own dollars to figure this out and study it at various universities. So grapeseed extract is what he came up with. Hang on one second. Um, and remember how this starts in the first place? Do you remember how it starts in the first place? What? Weakness. Yeah, weakness, you're out of homeostasis. You did something wrong or you had too much stress. You heard some really bad news. You know, people hear bad news and they're never the same from that point forward. You've heard these stories, maybe it's you. You know, like your mom dies and now you're never the same. Your, your health goes down or um, you get fired from a job and you, you, never get, you never recover. Okay, question? Yeah. I mean, is that more dangerous than mm -hmm. keeping them enclosed? No, you want to get them out and you want to kill them and clean them out. So, and it can be measured. So with this coronary artery calcium score, I have about six people whose scores have dropped, meaning that the calcium is coming out of their tissues and they're getting symptomatically better. You want to have improvement. Now, if the score stays at zero, or let's say the score is 400, and it stays at 400 for 30 years, and it's stable, that's really good too. So the placking is hardened and stable. It's a stable plaque. It's not going to go anywhere. You just don't want it to go up too fast. So if this goes up by more than 15% per year, that's dangerous. So like a bump that doesn't do anything is okay. Right, exactly. Yep, question. What does it do to the liver? It's the same thing from head to toe, no matter what the cell is or no, ma no matter what the organ is, it's the same process. Hardening. hardening, stiffening of your body. Okay, let's, let's go on with our home movie. So we're just, he's just showing um, um, samples. So nanobacterial igloos, homes of highly calcified forms. They're like igloos. So igloos butt off new nanobacteria. So they split. Remember, they're not alive, but they replicate. They self-replicate. They're making a biofilm to protect themselves? Yep, and then they reproduce, or they replicate. Isn't that crazy? We live on this planet and things like that happen. <clears throat> okay. So here's a collection of, uh, they start to form biofilm as a group. And that biofilm becomes more and more calcified. It's visible to the eye. This is not under a microscope. This is visible to the eye. <clears throat> it's resembling atherosclerotic plaque. Colors are caused by the thickness of biolayer. So the bigger it is, now you have more stuff involved. You have white blood cells that get involved. You know, like a plaque consists of 1% white blood cells, also known as foam cells. It consists of 4% saturated fat, 12% unsaturated fat, that's those seed oils, and 60%, I forgot the, do the number, 60 something percent collagen, scar tissue. Right, so the immune system is working on this and trying to deal with it. Just like when you cut your finger, now you get a scar there eventually, the body will scarify this plaque, this, these, uh, these colonies, the biofilm. And then when that lets loose, that's, that's a thrombus.
so it glows. Apatite, A-P-A-T-I-T-E, that's a term commonly seen with uh, stones, kidney stones, etc. I mean, why does it light up? Why does it light up white like that? I mean, it's calcium. Calcium is white, huh? Like chalk. Yeah. What if you have high LDL and high cholesterol? If that's their food, what happens to people that have? If you get on this and you have high LDL, high cholesterol. Well, you want to have a really strong. That's a very good question. You want to make sure your immune system is really strong to kill the nanobacteria, if possible. And number two, don't do dumb things with your health. You wanna stay in homeostasis. Don't stay up without sleep for two days in a row. Don't drink a bunch of alcohol. You know what I'm saying? Like keep your body in homeostasis. So we all have a propensity to some disease. And a lot of people, they got the propensity to have heart disease and a, and a heart attack. So you can say like my, my grand, both my grandfathers died of a heart issue. And then, um, as far as I know, the other great-grandfather, he died in his late 40s from a heart issue. And my dad has high, slightly high blood pressure. I have him on nanobac nanobac TX for a year, three a night for a year. So, and his blood test is doing good, huh? Did it change? Did it shift his blood pressure? I don't even know. Last time I saw him, I didn't talk to him about the blood pressure. Um, but I'm, so now he's taking a break from it. And uh, anyways, did I, am, I, am I answering your question? Yeah. Why only three? Because he's a German farmer from Northwest Ohio. <laughs> he doesn't like pills. <laughs> well, so the actual protocol would be the correct dosage for the body weight, and then after, let's say, a year, you can go to a maintenance dosage of three, for example. <laughs> now, some, getting back to your question, some people have a propensity to have blood chemistry that does not correlate well or jive with the arterial walls. And they just build plaques so fast, plus they're eating junk food and white, white bread and all that stuff, it's horrible. And they have a heart attack when they're 35. Or 45, you know. So, anyways, um, you can blame the LDL, but you know, if they were to take care of their body and their LDL stays high the whole time, you can live to be 80 and die from getting hit by a bus, right? But it's your actions that you do that cause this more than anything else, all right? But there are some unfortunate people that they're fit, they're thin, they exercise all the time, and they have a heart attack. But they're eating bread. There's a guy, Bob Harper, he was on The Biggest Loser. He was one of the trainers on The Biggest Loser. He had a heart attack. His blood protein A was high. I bought his book. I read his book. He blamed this. He blames his genetics. This is not a genetic thing. I mean, yeah, you could, sure. Sure, it's genetic. But fix it with ketosis. So instead of going into ketosis, he writes a book called The Super Carb Diet, where you increase your carbohydrates even higher. It's just completely... Okay, back to this. Um, so, we're at, so we're looking at these, uh, the nanobacteria, and then we're adding the nanobac TX again. This video I just found today, or last night. So you add it, and then it starts to, they start to go crazy. So then they add another dose. I just found this. I don't even know if this is a good video. I just found it last night at like 11 o'clock. <clears throat> huh? Someone's probably narrating it, but we just don't know what you're saying. No, I don't think there was a narration. No, there isn't. I, I watched it today. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, so Dr. Gary Mizo um, was uh, in trouble with the FDA. Uh, about five years ago, for saying things that were backed by research. He wasn't lying. He had clinical studies to show that he, what he was saying was the truth. He had the uh, laboratory findings to show that what he was saying was the truth. And on my YouTube channel, I was going to interview him about six months ago. And we had the date set up. We're going back and forth by email, like, hey, I want to talk about this and that. And then it was supposed to be on a Monday. Well, he emailed me 
Sunday night and he said, sorry, I can't do it. My FDA lawyer said not to because he might say the wrong thing and he gets thrown in jail, right? For talking about a supplement, this is a supplement related to a heart condition, related to a disease. But, you know, it's all semantics. It's just words, right? So the point here is that calcium is a nutrient and you can have too much calcium in a location. Then you take a nutritional supplement or a collection of them and you change your diet and it takes those nutrients where they're in excess and removes them and puts them somewhere else. Maybe you pee them out, maybe they go to your bones. So it's, it's still all nutritional. Like all, all of medicine needs to be, 90% of medicine needs to be nutritional, right? But it just comes down to um, money and territory. <clears throat> okay, um, this is a guy who, not this guy, but let me get this uh, video moving forward. This um, right here, see it says Silicon Valley Health Institute. They only have like 39,000 subscribers. They have some of the best speakers. Like we're, they're in Silicon Valley. I mean, they got brainy people there. They got MD researchers that, come on internet. Um, anyway, so they had this guy named Eric Gordon, G-O-R-D-A-N, talking about nanobacteria, talking about Gary Meisel, talking about Cahander, the discovery of it. And this guy, um, this is so annoying to me, sorry, I just got to click out of there. This guy, um, uh, Gordon, was saying that he's been doing IV EDTA chelation for years. He's an MD. And he goes, I don't see the reversal of disease with IV EDTA chelation. Now, the original form of this was a, a, like an enema suppository. You had to put it up your butt. And then, and then Gary Mizo put it in these capsules, and he designed the capsules to open up past the stomach so that the formulation would survive the acid of the stomach. Um, but this guy, Gordon, was saying, like, he, now he's seeing the results that you would like to see by taking it orally or by taking it rectally. But we don't have to do rectally anymore because we have the oral version. Now, there's a guy named Dr. Um, Jim Roberts. He's a cardiologist, cardiologist in Toledo. Raise your hand if you know Jim Roberts, James Roberts. He's my cardiologist. When I had the black mold and my heart's going crazy, I ran down to him. I'm like sitting in his room like, something's wrong. <laughs> it wasn't until months later when I found the mold, but I met him in the late 90s because I used to practice just a few blocks from him in Toledo. And um, so this guy, Gordon, um, in that previous video was talking about Dr. Roberts. So Roberts made another product with a similar EDTA type of um, uh, nutrient. And I don't know the name of it, but you know, like I said, there's about 15 different versions. So Roberts made his own. And other than that, I don't know of anybody else like promoting these solutions, talking about these solutions, you know, like for people to take and to do, like even Gary Meisel can't talk about it because he'll get thrown in jail potentially and lose his business. Okay, so um, there's all that. And look at that, it's 7.59. Um, ran out of things to say. Ask me some questions. What, what side effects should I say? What side effects of the, sometimes when you take 10 or 12 before bed, it might hurt your stomach. That's the only side effect that I know of. Right, it still can hurt your thing, whatever is here. People talk about this. Yeah. This area, they say that this hurts sometimes, but that's rare. Um, but I've had people where they take uh, the supplement and it's working, and they can feel it working. And so they have reduced the dosage so they're not so affected by it. So like pain appears and then it goes away. At one location, then another location, in the body. Um, that's kind of it. Most people do really well with it. Yeah. Um, question? Oh, I question? Yeah. Um, regarding the EDTA, I, I've read about it pulling all these toxic metals. Yes. So what if I have mercury in my body? Yeah, this pulls out the toxic metals too. So is that bad if you're, you shouldn't take this until you have your metal or 
No, no, this pulls the heavy metals out too. Does it hold on to them or free them too? Yeah, it holds on to them and yeah, yeah, it pulls them out. How's it going with these things? They're good still? Okay, good. Yeah, so yeah, detox. This is a standalone detox product. It's replacing the IV chelation. It's better than the IV chelation. What, what? So I have several different detox protocols and supplements. I have one, this one, two, three, four. I have five different detox protocols from different companies and I just match them up with the patient you know, like what can they can handle? Do we start off slowly? Do we do we hit it hard right now? Like that kind of stuff. And this is one of them. This is one of my detox protocols. Good question. Yeah, Doug. So does this get across the blood brain boundary and even further to the retina um, and help detox there as well? Um, I've been told yes. And so Dr. Mizo talking about um, <clears throat> what did I say for the eye? I said um, cataracts, right? Yeah, he said it takes a long time to clean that out, but yes, it would. Glaucoma questions as well. You know, just about blood flow. He said it's good for glaucoma too. For the eye, it takes a long time. And for the, um, like for the heart stuff, for some people it could be, I mean, easily more than a year, but just, trace, just training it with the CAC. Good? Okay, good. Yeah, go ahead. Does it help with macular degeneration? I'm not sure about that. I don't know how to answer that question. The Leonidas 61X, could tendinitis potentially be treated by TX? Tendinitis? Yeah, um, chronic tendinitis would be like part of the inflammatory process um, as long as there's not a continual trauma to it. So point of this is that you have some sort of pathological condition with the tendon and then how do you get the that part of the body beyond the you know through the healing process the healing process has a, a beginning middle and end and if you have chronic pain it's because you're stuck in the middle and that 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 inflammatory process isn't going away because the healing's not happening so once the healing starts to occur then the inflammation goes away, and then you have resolution of the healing cycle. So, you know, pulling excess calcium out of tissue certainly is part of resolving chronic inflammation. There's a couple questions over here. Yeah. I've got a question on K2, and if you do have, um, if you do have um, calcium in your arteries and you're taking the K2, and it's supposed to mobilize calcium, I'm just wondering whether or not no, this is so. The question is, if you take K two, it mobilizes calcium. You might get a heart attack. That's what I was wondering. Right? No, this is a, a dissolution of the area of the problem. It's not like a, it's not like you take a hammer and you bust it into pieces and they go flying through your arteries. It dissolves it like you saw on the screen. It's a it's a dissolution of it. Or emulsification, kind of. Good? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, question. So this is a solution to my rheumatoid arthritis. To your who? Rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis? I don't know. <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis is a bear. I've had success with it, and then I've had some cases not no success. But it's worth a try. Mm -hmm. There's my answer for that. Question? Yeah. And then the other thing was, I wanted to ask you how you found it, where you found it, and how you have it in your little vial. Like, what is oh, it? Oh, the little vial is a homeopathic representation of it. And does that, but that came from the, that got diluted from a, some of the CNN. No, no, it's uh, made um, from a computer. A guy in Oregon does that. He, the, this guy in Oregon makes all the test kits for all the people that do muscle testing. And so it's, a, it's radionics, you know, Tesla. Tesla was, a, you know, Nikola Tesla? Yeah, so he, 
was like a specialist in radionics, right? Not like necessarily our radio frequency or EMS or electric radionics. So this is what this guy in Oregon says that he studied a lot of Tesla. He developed this computer specialized in radionics. So he makes these homeopathic um, vials. So it matches the energy of the... Right, exactly. So the other question was sort of like, how, do you, how can you measure it or know if you have it, whether it's in your heart or your kidney or your lungs? The nanobacteria? Yeah. Well, there was a lab. I looked it up last night, uh, um, nanobacklab.com, and it, they don't exist anymore, but they used to exist, according to this guy, Eric Gordon. There might be a lab now that measures it. So, but. And you can find it by a muscle test, like whether it's in your kidney or. Well, yeah, I do the muscle testing, but the truth is, if your CAC is high or you have a chronic autoimmune condition that's not responding very well to many other things, you just start taking it. Or if you have heavy metals, right? You know, like this, look at, look at it clinically and then give it two, three months and see what happens. Yeah. Well, the researchers said that 97% of kidney stones have nanobacteria. So yeah, you have a kidney stone in your hand? Yeah. <laughs> I can tell because it's a kidney stone. Oh, your first question was about if they're not alive, then how do you kill them? You got to break their process. You got to break their self-replicating process. You got to break their, their exudate and break their igloos. They go dormant, yeah. and they come back. They go dormant, yeah. And do they live in the gut as well? Or they, they live wherever they want. They've been found on asteroids, like um, on meteorites that have landed on, planet, on the Earth. They're out in space. They're in the water. They're everywhere. It feels like we might just be made up of them, you know, like stardust. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Another question? Is a, is a, is a, there's a surgery, is it, which is study not to study how the more it is? What's, oh, like a, what's, like a cyst might have more? I mean, a state, a state, a state, a state which is study you know, not to study how the more it is, uh, track classification. Wait, what would have more of it? What, what the state? Do what a, state? Do a on, got more, I'm not sure what you're asking. asking the state of the body. Okay. No, I mean, in a in the state, okay. New York has more... Oh, I have no idea. I'm, I, I, I think that's a sort of a Lyme disease sort of a question. Is it sh it's like in every person. These are things that are everywhere. They're everywhere. But you just want them to be dormant. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not like thriving. What do you think about MSM? I think, it's a, I think it's a form of sulfur that is good. I mean, as far as possibly softening the calcium? No, no, no. no. Question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, um, I passed the seven millimeter kidney stone, and it was 80% uh, calcium, uh, oxalate, 10% uh, or 15% uh, uric acid, but it was a small percentage protein, and nobody could tell me why it had protein in it. it I believe it's only supposed to have calcium, oxalate, or, and or uric acid. And so I'm just wondering, why would I have protein in my stomach? Nobody can tell me. <laughs> I don't think the urologist would tell me that. But. I don't know how to answer that either. If, if, if you eat a lot of eggs, I don't know. Well, no, I it's not that. I mean, like, it's like, why is there, if you look, I don't know, I just like, it's like, why do you have um, worms in your garden? It's just part of nature. I just see it to be like that. So it's hard for me to figure out what to eat, because I love red meat. I eat red meat all the time, but yeah. I also get uric acid. Okay. Um, so, what do you do when you have kidney stones that are both, and, you know, sometimes I get, like, it's almost like a gout pain a little bit. So you're doing low carb, right? Um, I'm supposed to be, yeah. Okay, so uric acid goes up with high carb, right? Gout is an issue of um, eating uh, high carb meals. So King's... So maybe I'm No, no. Listen. So listen. So in the 1500s, the kings got gout, 
and they would lay in bed and their toes would be up and the, the weight of the blanket was too much for their toes. What did kings eat that peasants couldn't eat? Sugar. Sugar. The peasants had animals and they had plants, but the kings could afford spices and sugar and desserts. So, so maybe you have elevated uric acid from your previous diet from before. And um, there is a guy on, online that was saying that his uric acid completely normalized by eating just carnivore. Now you can eat meat and then have a flare-up of your pain and you get the gout pain, so that is an issue. So this could be maybe where this, something like this can play a role in reducing the amount of uric acid and crystals in your body. Now up here in my, with my older protocol, I got the fast food and that right there too could potentially help with that situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. So the kidney stone is made out of uric acid plus other things, the, the minerals and stuff. It's the same process, right? But in the meantime, don't kill yourself by eating red meat with a gout pain, okay, while you're fixing the original situation. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, good. All right, let's end this. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. <clears throat> And if you want to be a patient, you can talk to...